It's the Canon Sports Podcast. On today's episode, we're joined by 16-year Major League veteran and the head coach of Sierra Canyon Baseball, Jerry Royster. Welcome in, everybody, to the Canon Sports Podcast. Today, we are at Sierra Canyon High School. I'm Phil George, and our guest today is... He is a 16-year Major League Baseball veteran, significant coaching experience in professional baseball in both Major League Baseball and Korea, and he's the head coach here of the Sierra Canyon Varsity Baseball Program, Coach Jerry Royster. Coach, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Good to be on with you. Coach, you have a rather unparalleled experience in baseball, and I could not do it justice to explain it myself, so I'm going to open the floor to you. Why don't you introduce (laughs) yourself to our viewers and give everybody some background uh, about your involvement in the game? Well, um, we'll get back to all the way back to high school. Um, If we go back further than that, it'd take even longer, but uh, uh, I started, obviously, I started in Little League Baseball um, like most kids did. my father was my coach forever until I got into high school. Um, uh, went through high school, um, signed, became a professional with the Dodgers right out of right out of high school. Um, baseball wasn't my main sport, um, so I was actually heading down to Southern California, uh, down here to Southern California to play basketball, and also um, uh, my my main choice really. Uh, probably would have ended up being um, uh, Washington State where I could have played two sports. So and uh, uh, football and basketball, not baseball. (laughs) But uh, anyway, when I signed with the Dodgers, it was um, uh, in out of the summer league. One of my uh, great friends, uh, Roland Office, who uh, also had a nice little major league career himself, um, uh, his um, shortstop had gone on vacation and um, they needed somebody to play uh, just a couple of games. He said, if you play two games with us, he says, we'll be fine. But if you can't play, we're going to be in trouble. Ended up uh, uh, being seen by several scouts. uh, But uh, uh, the Dodger scout was very, very aggressive and uh, uh, talked me out of uh, basketball and talked me out of uh, of, basketball. of football and uh, eventually I ended up signing and becoming becoming a professional. Awesome. And your professional career turned cool. into a rather significant coaching career. We're going to get into several elements of that, including mm-hmm. your time overseas in Korea. But first, I want to go ahead and talk about the season that just ended here at Sierra Canyon. You guys ended the season ranked number 12 in the state of California and Two players on the list of uh, top 200 MLB draft prospects, Jaden Newt, Cassius Thomas, both right-handed pitchers. So give me your takeaways from this season, and let's go ahead and preview some of the guys who are about to have their name names called in the draft in a couple of months. Oh, great. Um, let's talk about them. I, I love talking about Jaden and Cassius. Those guys have, uh, uh, I've been with them all four years of, of their high school career, Um uh, they've grown and 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 worked their way into a position, like you said, of being one of the, uh, two of the top pitchers. At at one point, they were ranked one and two in the state of California. Uh, that was uh, in our in the preseason polls. Uh, we ended up twelve as a team, um, uh, which is kind of disappointing to be honest. Uh, but um, you know, losing early in the playoffs did not help, and uh, injuries. Uh, 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 didn't help, and uh, Cassius being shut down at a certain time, a crucial time uh, of our schedule, uh, didn't hurt. It didn't help either. Um, <clears throat> when uh, you talk about Jade Newt, who is six foot four, two hundred and twenty five pounds, um, you know, just a prototypical draft pick. Uh, uh, scouts are drooling over him; have been for a couple of years. Uh, Cassius came on a little bit later. Um, which was, uh, I mean, he rallied uh, very nicely uh, uh, over the summer. Uh, he he did some pretty amazing uh, things on the mound and uh, became a uh, 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 really a top prospect. It was really hard for us to tell who was number one and who was number two uh, at times, but uh, both of them have fastballs in the mid nineties. Um, and, uh, and both of them have at least two other pitches that, 
um, that were used quite uh, uh, heartily <laughs> through this season. We did not lose a game that they pitched in. Um, uh, it was um, it, it, it was fun these 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 last four years watching these guys grow. And this is a man right here who, when he says that he's got a top prospect on his team, you should probably believe him because you have significant coaching experience in the minor leagues, like we talked about, and not just in the minor leagues, but coaching Hall of Famers during those days. Mm -hmm. um, talk about some of those guys that you coached down there that would ultimately go on to the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. And if uh, if any of your guys on this team stack up in, in, in the early going. <laughs> it's so hard to tell what's going to happen in the future. And um, and I try to tell my kids that uh, whether you're the Jaden Nude or Cassius Thomas or or you're the uh, uh, the last guy on the JV team, you, you just don't know how it's going to end up. I had no idea I was going to end up being a a uh, professional baseball player. Uh, I played baseball for fun all my life. Um, my dad would not have had it any other way, but um, uh, uh, coaching in the minor leagues uh, just happened after I finished my 16 year career. Um, uh, I was asked by the Dodgers, not even a month later, the uh, general manager at the time called and asked me if I would, uh, uh, what I consider uh, managing uh, minor league baseball. And I said, nope, I just started my family. <laughs> and um, I wanted to uh, definitely watch my, uh, my, my young daughter grow up. And um, I wanted to be part of that. Uh, when he told me that I'd be uh, coaching in Kissimmee and I would have every, uh, every Monday every Saturday, Sunday, and Monday off, I said, that would, I said, I could probably do that. And, uh, that's how it began. But on that team, I had, uh, I had Eric Young, uh, was on my team. Johnny Padres was my pitching coach. Um, you know, being able to, uh, uh, come through the Dodger system was just amazing being around Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale, uh, uh, Johnny Roseboro. These guys were all helping, helping me coach, <laughs> coach these teams. So I had a lot of, I had a, I had a lot, a lot of help. Um, uh, like I said, Eric Young was on that team. Um, the next year, uh, uh, I had Pedro Stasio, which, which is a name that, uh, is very familiar around these parts, uh, uh, pitched very well with the Dodgers, uh, for most of his career. Um, we also, um, uh, 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 both those guys went to double A with me. That was in, uh, the rookie league and, and low A and they went, both went to double A with me. And, um, uh, on that team, uh, Mike Piazza was my, was my starting catcher. Um, uh, I say that he was on my team, but, uh, uh, I think he was there for approximately, I don't know, 22 days and, <laughs> and was hitting, uh, batting and catching enormously and, uh, uh, was immediately called up. Yeah. When you hit, when you hit like him, you're not going to last uh, that long in double A. He was, uh, he was, he, he was up and gone. They took him, uh, Bill Russell at the time was the triple A manager and they took him to, uh, um, Albuquerque and, uh, he ended up, uh, 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 staying there for like 10 days and then went on to his hall of fame career. Um, I had several other players, uh, uh, Pedro Martinez, his first year, uh, coming over, um, also, um, one of the first people, um, that Chan Ho Park saw, uh, coming over was, was Jerry Royster also, but, uh, no, it was, it's been good. The, my whole experience in the minor leagues was great. And, uh, just parlayed into amazing coaching Hall of Famers in the major leagues and and managing Hall of Famers. It's it's, it's pretty cool. And so you've seen all of those high caliber players at such a young age. Now you have the chance to coach the guys that we talked about. They are also very high caliber players at a much younger age than even the the guys that you coach in the minors who would go on to become Hall of Famers themselves. When you're watching a player that young, can you can you tell from looking at him that, you know, okay, this, this is not just a talented player. This is a cut above the rest. What is it about those players that stand out immediately? Well, uh, at that age, everyone develops, uh, 
at a different time. I mean, no, no one, uh, you don't know if, a, like I said, you don't know if a kid if, is the last player on the, on the JV team is going to turn out to be a good college or professional baseball player, but uh, uh, you can always see some talent in some of the, some of the kids and uh, um, uh, looking at uh, watching Jaden Newt be a two-way player um, loving the fact that, you know, he can hit home runs. He's led our team in home runs the last couple of years. Um, uh, every time we go somewhere over the summer and um, uh, people marvel at his power and, and his ability to, to hit uh, uh, until he gets on the mound and he throws 97 miles an hour, and then uh, <laughs> all the attention goes there. But uh, dealing with uh, scouts on a daily basis uh, with those two guys around, um, has brought a lot of attention to uh, two of our other guys that have garnered a lot of attention. Uh, even though Jaden and Cassius may go early in the draft, um, uh, Max Martin, uh, uh, Eddie Magdasian, uh, these two guys have uh, uh, scouts ask me about them all the time and, and, and now call me to find out when they're going to pitch. And they just had a couple of uh, big college commitments, those two, right? Both of them did. Both of them, uh, let's go back to Jaden, is committed to LSU. Uh, Cassius is committed to Duke. Um, um, Max Martin is at uh, UC Irvine. Uh, and uh, Eddie McDajian just uh, recently uh, committed to, to pitch at USC. Awesome. Um, you mentioned a little bit ago about Jaden's prowess as a two-way player leading the team in home runs while also starring on the mound. Uh, we've seen several two-way players <laughs> in recent years get drafted into baseball, but usually pick between hitting or pitching by the time they reach the major leagues. Hunter Green yes. was drafted as a shortstop, uh, now is exclusively a pitcher and has been doing pretty well for the Cincinnati Reds. Um, Shohei Otani is really the only one doing both consistently, but do you think Jaden Newt uh, has the potential to be one of those guys who sticks with both pitching and hitting at the professional level? Well, you know, for me as a coach and um, as a quasi scout, I, I, I just see his pitching ability to be something that, uh, that you just can't look past. I mean, you, you want to see him putting all of his attention on that, but who am I to say that he can't do it? If he's, if he can, um, uh, 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 garner this power, uh, even the last couple of weeks of, of the season, he, you know, I was finally able to get it through his head to have a different approach at the plate. And, uh, uh, he became, I thought he became a much better hitter. Uh, so who knows? And like you said, you mentioned Hunter Green and, uh, I'm, I'm sure Hunter probably still thinks that he's uh, able to hit and, uh, um, you know, and who's to say that it won't happen. I, I, don't, I don't, I've never seen anything quite like Shohei. And, and once Shohei um, uh, did what he did last year, the last couple of years, it's, it's, it's been amazing. And, um, uh, and after, like you said, I coached in Asia, and so I get a lot of calls on Shohei Otani. Um, I've done some work with Nike baseball and, uh, as I was working with one of their other star players, Mike Trout, uh, 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 Shohei always was there doing work. This was in spring training. He was always there doing work. Uh, but he always was able to separate the two. He was doing work on his hitting. He would take a break. He'd come back and do pitching, whatever, whichever way he did it. Um, but, um, uh, I, I've never seen anything quite like this kid. This kid is throwing a hundred and um, and hitting home runs in the major leagues and being the best player at times in the league. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, he is a he is a heck of a star. And I don't know. If, I mean, we haven't really seen anything like him since Babe Ruth, and I don't know if it'll be another hundred years before we uh, yeah. see anything like that again. But let's. I'm pretty sure. Let's see if Jaden can get close. That, though. I'm pretty sure Babe Ruth can't do. Could, did not do what this guy's doing. And uh, uh, just checking the stats, uh, Babe Ruth was great, but he wasn't, he wasn't this great. <laughs> right. So again, and both. <laughs> so getting back to your program here at Sierra Canyon, you were hired after the 2018 season and your predecessor, a uh, gentleman by the name of Rick Weber, had this program in pretty good shape uh, at the time that he departed. Two Gold Coast titles, a championship game appearance, and led the ascendance from Division Seven all the way up to Division Two. 
you come in and what were your what was your mission statement upon coming in to build upon that success? Well, first of all, I came in as a favor. I came in as a favor and I also came in uh, I came in as a favor to one of my friends. He had a kid that was going to be a ninth grader here. Uh, so I came in when he was an eighth grader, uh, was around Rick and, and the players uh and the varsity players and uh, Rick asked me if I would if I'd stick around and you know and, and try to help out and I told him I'd do what I could if you know whatever time uh, uh, permitted um, and I did that for a little over a year. Then they asked me to um, uh, Jim Scrumbus, who is head of school here, and uh, and Rock Pillsbury, who is the athletic director. They uh, we sat down at lunch and. Uh, they asked me if I could, you know, bring what I, my so-called expertise in and uh, try to uh, uh, step the program up even further. Uh, the job that Rick did was <laughs> amazing, and uh, he's still doing the same thing at, at over at Viewpoint. Uh, they just lost in the in their playoffs just uh, just the other day. Uh, but uh, uh, talk about a guy that's organized. Some of the things I've learned from him is. Uh, 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 you know, how to be a little more organized. Uh, and uh, so he left and went to Viewpoint. I became the head coach here um, uh, uh, for, I think, two years. And then <laughs> I had to bring in some real, some guys that knew a lot more about high school and, uh, and youth baseball than I did. And one of those guys has the winningest record in the entire state of California since uh, 1990. Let's introduce uh, folks to <laughs> your associate head coach, Tom Musborn. I don't think that he needs much of an introduction in into this world. He's done college, USA, uh, high school. He uh, uh, runs a, um, uh, a a travel team and an organization. Um, uh, called the Vipers. I mean, it's, he, he is so well known around here. So, uh, even though I'm the head coach, he, you know, I, I follow his lead in so many different ways. And, uh, uh, he was able to, uh, uh, bring some of the guys that, that, uh, helped him out along the way, uh, and, uh, added them to our staff. And, uh, uh, and then I kept a couple of the guys that have been around, uh, for a while, uh, John Tovin and, uh, Rocco Berriel. Uh, uh, brought uh, I brought them and kept them on on staff and uh, uh, we we just uh, we took off. That's when this when this program really took off and became a, a nationally known team. So you've brought this program significant strides forward in terms of the baseball knowledge and experience on staff. You've kept up the culture of winning and a nationally ranked team. You're about to put a couple of guys in the professional ranks, possibly even more than that. And in 2018, shortly after your arrival, you signed on uh, with the Nike Elite program. Can you tell us how you came to be involved with that? <laughs> Again, it goes right back to the Shohei Otani question. Uh, uh, I was doing um, uh, baseball-related stuff with, uh, with Nike or for Nike, and uh, uh, they... Uh, we were actually, uh, they, they brought me on because of my, my nephew, my nephew, Maziel Royster, um, was literally working for Nike and, uh, he needed a baseball representative, right? He was starting to deal with some high powered, uh, major leaguers. And, uh, uh, he called his uncle and said, uncle Jerry, he says, I, I could use your help. You know, if you can just come in and just kind of guide these guys through, uh, some of the, uh, commercials that they do. And, uh, uh, and I said, sure. I said, I'll, I'll do it. And, um, uh, it turned into, um, uh, like a five year career. <laughs> I've been doing it now for, I think about five or six years. And, um, it's, uh, 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 uh having the guys go through making them look as authentic as possible for a commercial. So when you see Mike Trout, uh, or you, or you see, uh, John Carlos Stanton, when you see these guys jumping over a wall or hitting a home run in a commercial, uh, I'm usually on the other side, just making sure that the, uh, that the swings, uh, look authentic and, uh, uh, and then Nike does their magic and, uh, 
and, and makes it look like they're actually playing in a real game. At the time that you signed that deal, uh, the Sierra Canyon boys and girls basketball programs were members of the program. But at the time, the only baseball program that was affiliated with Nike Elite was down at Modern Day. To become only the second baseball program affiliated uh, with Nike Elite, what did that distinction mean for you in this program? Well, it was great, but uh, I literally had to beg them. I uh, uh, I can't recall all their names, but uh, all the people that I work with with Nike, I uh, I told them. I said, "Hey, listen, I'm doing high school baseball now, and um, uh, you know, I I'd, I'd like for you to uh, help, you know, sponsor our team." And um, uh, after my first year of doing it, of uh, of being uh, the head coach here, they said. Yeah, we want to make you Nike Elite, and we started talking about different programs that might work with uh, um, uh, uh, within the system, and started talking about bringing other other teams in, other schools in, and and uh, and uh, developing, you know, just the Nike Elite program for for not just us, but now I think they're up to like fifteen or eighteen teams. I'm not sure how many they are, but uh, 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 I took that. Uh, the school liked it. Uh, they signed on with it. Um, uh, the kids absolutely love it. So <laughs> they get a lot of swag. So it's, uh, uh, it, it means something, you know, and, and now uh, not only were we representing the school, but we are also representing the brand Nike. Right. And to be recognized by a brand of that caliber is one of the best programs in the nation. I'm sure that has tons of benefits in terms of recruitment and exposure and even, you know, help in getting those players recognized at, uh, at the next level? Well, we do tours at the, at the school. I mean, um, uh, kids want to g- come here. They want to come here because of the football. They want to come here because of the basketball and uh, uh, the girls sports are amazing. I mean, our girls basketball, uh, e- even our softball teams and uh, our volleyball team, all nationally known teams. And, uh, uh, with that being said, uh, uh, we we ended up, uh, uh, you know, we were once I came on, we were able to do a lot more. And uh, like you said, the basketball boys and girls basketball team were already doing their thing and uh, producing uh, NBA players and uh, and uh, major college uh, uh, girls basketball also. So it was. Uh, uh, it's it's great. It, the recognition is amazing. I I thought that the kids. Uh, 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 represent it well. Uh, as you see, I run around with Nike, everything, and uh, uh, my kids at home and my whole family now benefits <laughs> from the fact that we are Nike Elite. Let's go ahead and switch gears and talk about your involvement in the Korean baseball organization, mm-hmm. KBO. Um, you were the first, not only the first American, but the first non Korean to manage a team in the KBO. How did that opportunity come to present itself? <laughs> Okay, so in the, in the beginning, um, again, I had just uh, been pretty much hanging out with the family, and uh, I had uh, uh, it was 20, 2008, so I had just finished managing AAA, and on that AAA team was Andre Ethier, Matt Kemp, James Loney, and you can go on and on about uh, the Jacksonville uh, Five. <laughs> They were unbelievable, and they came up. Uh, at this time, I was in Las Vegas, and uh, these guys, uh, 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 I was able to send all of them to the major leagues. Obviously, uh, uh, kind of horn their talents, and then and then send them send them on their way. But um, uh, that's how that's how it, how it all began. You know, I just I I that was my last year, two thousand six. And 2007, I said, I'm not doing, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I've been doing this since 1970. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's, let's move on. And that's when uh, I got a call from uh, Bobby Valentine and, um, and uh, we have the same agent and um, Bobby was asked, Bobby was at the time was in Japan uh, managing uh, a team over there to, and just doing Amazing. He things. became a Winning superstar over there. Oh, he, and he still is. And he still is. Uh, Bobby uh, 
was asked by the owner of his Japanese team if he had someone like him that would go to Korea and, you know, try to uh, help run a program like the way Bobby does. So um, <laughs> I'm thankful that he thought of me and um, uh, gave me a call and said, hey, I need you to come to Japan. Uh, I need you to meet my owner. He wants you to uh, come over and manage in Korea. And, and I'm thinking, you know, this golf thing that I'm doing right now, I'm, my game is getting really good. I'm not sure I wanted to quit. <laughs> But uh, I don't have golf courses in Korea. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that became a thing, by the way. That was really good. But anyway, so that's how I got over there. That's how that's how uh, I, I went over to Japan uh, for 10 days and um, met with the owner. Uh, he signed me on 2008. I start my uh, first year. Um, I start my first year as manager over there. Um, I had a lot of support. I had I had support from names that I won't put out there, but, uh, uh, they know who they are. I, I don't know that I could have gotten, uh, through it all, but, um, uh, I was blowing up Bobby's phone quite often and, uh, uh, uh and learned to love it very quickly, very quickly, uh, spring training in, in, uh, in Japan when it was like 18 degrees and, uh, standing in front of uh, fire pits, you know, keeping my hands warm while the players are out there <laughs> struggling to, uh, stop from freezing uh, to becoming. Uh, uh, I, I took over a team that hadn't been to the playoffs in nine years um, and hadn't had much success, but they were very good. They drew. They drew well. They had five hundred thousand people. I think one year prior to me going over there. Over and how many games? A hundred and I want to say one hundred and thirty-two. That's a, good, that's a good crowd. Yeah, that was really good. It was really good, and it was they were always the top draw, but they were never, they, you know, they had actually finished in last four of the last five years prior to me coming. And uh, they, um, uh, uh, we were able to, you know, turn that around real quick. I took uh, another ex-major leaguer with me. Fernando Arroyo was, uh, was my pitching coach. That was the one thing that I uh, figured I'd need, and Bobby verified that, yes, you will need an American-speaking uh, uh, pitching coach. So I, I did, uh, worked with the, uh, with the Koreans, uh, uh, and the coaching staff over there, they weren't very, <laughs> the coaching staff was harder to win over than the players were. The players were very happy to, to see me come in and, uh, and learn a new way of playing baseball. Uh, we did some things that, uh, that kind of changed the way they, 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 they did things over there. And, uh, we ended up making the playoffs my first year and um, drawing over a million people. Wow. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you said that they specifically wanted to bring in somebody like Bobby Valentine. Now, <laughs> if anybody watching has seen Bobby Valentine manage, you know that he, <laughs> shall, shall we call it a fiery style of, uh, of managing? You think that's accurate? Well, see, they weren't looking for the managing part there. Uh, they wanted me to manage, help manage how the team looked and how they went about things and how the players uh, uh, make sure that they, the players were being developed. And, uh, and, and that was one of the things I was able to do. Actually, one of my players, um, was very popular. That was very popular over there. Um, uh, he ended up winning the triple crown and, um, uh, they wanted to cut him. They wanted to cut his salary. <laughs> and, uh, so we, we started, I started working with the front office and, and, and started, uh, to figure out the owner wanted one thing and the front and, and the people that ran the, the baseball side of, of things wanted something else. So obviously the owner won out and uh, we ended up uh, with a lot of winning baseball for, for the three years I was there. One, uh, easily one of the best experiences I've ever had. Well, you did earn yourself a nickname over there. They called you Hurricane Royster. Couple of qu <laughs> you're ro you're rolling your eyes. Not so much a fan. No, I I, I like it, but it, it it was what happened was we ended up being this team that drew a lot of people. I I brought over all kind of uh, our Western style of of doing stuff. Uh, uh, I had people on the field uh, standing with the team during the national anthem. They didn't even do the national anthem before I went there. So um, uh, we started doing things. We started being getting real popular and winning at the same time. So, uh, uh, you know, they, they came up with this Hurricane Royster. They came up with a song, but they had a song for every single player. Every time a player walked up to the plate,
they played a song for them. But so they obviously they uh, came up with one for me. <laughs> and you got that because like you like you alluded to, you brought a more what was described as a more aggressive, confident approach to uh, a league known for a more cautious exactly. approach. Talk about some of those differences between the traditional Korean game and the American game that you were accustomed to and the kind of the elements that you tried to bring from one to the other. Well, uh, so let me go back. So I, I needed an interpreter. So I went right to the Dodgers uh, 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 and, and asked them, is there, you know, who do we have that can, who do you have that can, uh, that I can take over to Korea with me and be my interpreter. Uh, and, um, uh, and they said, well, we, you know, who comes to mind is Curtis Jung. Curtis Jung ended up being Curtis Jung was a friend of mine already prior to that. Uh, as I was working through the minor leagues, uh, with the Dodgers, uh, Curtis and I, so we got on the phone and he was calling people saying who could come over. He says, I can't do it, Jerry. There's no way I, you know, Anyway, I talked him into coming over, and uh, he ended up staying even after I left, and uh, ended up marrying a girl. He was—he's a Korean American. Uh, Curtis is, and uh, 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 we did stuff. I, we were able to talk them into to uh, to doing things that they would never do. But the different styles—I mean, first thing we did was I made him come up with signs, which is a Bobby Valentine ism. Uh, we had signs. We put signs all over the locker room. No fear no fear the whole thing the the the, uh, the whole league was uh, uh was kind of based on 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 being afraid to make a mistake right so the other teams like uh i'm going to say in the second inning the third baseman for the other team ended up uh dropping a foul ball pop-up in the second inning and they took him out of the game he's out and I'm going like, yes, you know, we got to now we have a chance. At least we have a chance. You know, this guy's out and he was one of the stars of the team. So uh, uh, you you strike out two times in a row. They they'll have somebody pitch hit for you. Right. You have a bad week. You go to the minor leagues and they bring up a much worse player than than the guy that they sent down. Uh, so uh, we went just the opposite of all that. No, we there's no fear. I want you to uh, play as hard as you can. Uh, the only time you're going to get in trouble with me is when you're not being aggressive or when you're, when you are playing a little scared and, uh, taught our pitchers, uh, 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 with Fernando, you know, we taught our pitchers to pitch inside, which is a no, no over there. Because if you hit someone that is older than you, you know, you have to bow to them and, you know, you might even, uh, sit out a game. Uh, because because you hit a star, so we learn. Not even if you do it intentionally, even if you do it by accident, has no has no bearing on if it's intentional or not. Um, Did players intentionally throw at people in in Korea? Absolutely not. Under no circumstance. No, they did not. They did not throw at people. They do now. <laughs> that was one of the things that that we learned. So this is. Uh, uh, so we learned how to pitch inside. So we were able to get some of the better hitters out a lot easier, uh, and it opened up. You know the outside part of the plate. Uh, and, you know, they're giving me credit for all this. This is stuff that we've been doing for, uh, for years and years and uh, teaching Pedro Estacio, p- teaching Pedro Martinez, you know, uh, how to pitch inside, how to, how to uh, set hitters up and, and doing things like that. So um, that year we made the, uh, b- right before the all-star game. No, it was right after the all-star game. So all eight of our players made made the All Star team, and uh, and two of our pitchers, uh, they were all starters. It's voted on by the fans. They voted on every single one of our players. Wow! After that, and uh, so things kind of took off right away. And then uh, we t- took a break for the Olympics, and the team uh, Korea ended up winning uh, the Olympics that year. Two thousand eight baseball uh, came back into existence, and uh, and Korea ended up winning it. And uh, again, I got credit for that, which <laughs> trust me, it wasn't it wasn't because of me. Uh, but uh, the coaches ended up, you know, adopting some of the styles that we did, and and uh, I became very good friends with a lot of them. Uh, and um, Korea Korea has a very special part uh, in my baseball heart for sure. Another big difference over there is the fan environment and. 
I've never been to a game out there, but from my understanding, it seems like a combination <laughs> of American college football, international soccer, all mm. rolled up into baseball. They've got cheerleaders, chants, songs. Is it like anything you've ever seen before? Never. And and our team in particular, like I said, we were the most popular team in the league easily. And uh, no matter where we went, we went throughout the country, traveling throughout the country, playing against the other teams. And uh, I, I mean, one of the things that we did in the eighth inning of every single game is they had these plastic bags because they didn't go for rappers being on the ground, you know. So uh, everybody, when you bought something, you got a plastic bag that you put uh, trash in. Well, they turned those trash into bonnets on, on, on their head. And you look around the stadium and there's 30,000 people with this orange uh, bonnet uh, paper bag on their head. And it just seems, it just seems dangerous. <laughs> and they had a song. Putting trash bags on your head? No, not cover your whole head. It was a hat. They made it, they made it into a hat. And the kid, and oh man. And they had a song that they sung every single time. And it's, uh, it was a, a song about the city. It was a uh, Busan. My team was called uh, Busan Lote Giants. And and a uh, uh, Busan uh, song, which I ended up having to sing in Korea with the mayor because I told them if we make the playoffs, I told them before I even managed a game, if we make the playoffs, I will sing this song with the, with the mayor of the city on the field. And boy, when we won and they set that up, it was uh, standing room only. It was, it was kind of, it was, it was a fun, fun night. You, you know I'm going to have to ask you to, to, to give me a couple bars oh, right sure. now, right? Sure. No, I'm not going to give you any <laughs> bars. I, uh, but it, uh, Busan, Busan Kamegi, man. And it was, it was about our bird. It was a bird that represented the city. And yeah. Very cool. It does bring a smile to my face still. One common theme that comes up on, uh, on this show is alternative routes of player development. And KBO has really become an outlet for American players to go overseas and really raise their stock. Um, in recent years, we've seen guys like Eric Thames and Josh Lindblom uh, go overseas, dominate, win MVPs, um, win the top pitching award over there, and then come back and make millions after they rediscovered their form. Yasiel Puig is one of those guys who's over there right, right now. now trying to work his way back into Major League Baseball. Talk about KBO uh, and that dynamic of it as a route of development for American players trying to get back into ball over here. When I was there, um, you were allowed two to start with. You were allowed two uh, foreign players. It, it didn't matter where it was from, whether it was uh, Japan or if it was Asia or or America, uh, or any of the Latin American uh, organizations. But uh, I took over Kareem Garcia, uh, who went with me, who was, you know, obviously a good power hitting uh, outfielder uh, that that can really, really throw and play, play defense, right? But Kareem was known for his power hitting. He, he went over there um, with me the first year and uh, – just lit it up and ended up leading the um, uh, the voting for the All Star game, which is wait a minute, not a foreigner. They, they don't get to do that, but Kareem did, and uh, and uh, the second place guy was was my third baseman who had won the triple crown. But anyway, it was uh, 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 players that have come over that have come over there uh, to play for the other teams. Uh, Kareem did not go back to the major leagues, but. Uh, he did start working for major league teams in, in different aspects. Uh, and uh, uh, Korea was, uh, was back on the map at that, at that point in time and uh, as, a, as, a, as a means of being able to develop. But the two players that you brought over there, they really have to perform in order for your team to be good. They really rely on it. Now I think it's up to four, um, four foreigners, and uh, uh, they didn't want uh, the foreigners to come and take away from uh, – uh, from the homegrown uh, talent, and um, uh, and they didn't. We we were able to uh, combine the two uh, very easily, and uh, uh, they ended up. Uh, uh, we ended up being very very good about bringing over the right people that can contribute and help help you win a championship or make it to at, at least make it to the playoffs. 
Well, and I think one thing that uh, not a lot of players realize over here is that with I mean, obviously you see the gargantuan contracts that uh, that the top stars in Major League Baseball are are getting over here, getting into 30, 40 million dollars. And even though that kind of money isn't there in Korea, there are, you know, some guys who can make significantly more money over there and, you know, not just in Korea, but, you know, tons of foreign leagues across uh, right. across all sports. Right. Um, it's not necessarily the right move for everybody, but having the experience that you have both at home and overseas, what kind of player is that opportunity right for and to continue their development? Well, it's right for the player that... Uh, that is struggling, that one that's struggling here and, um, you know, they're fumbling around looking for jobs. They're playing in, uh, independent league baseball uh, when they're a little bit better than that. Uh, uh, so, you know, you can go over to Asia, uh, not only Korea, like you said, it's, you know, it's the same way in Taiwan and, and, uh, uh, and Japan uh, also. Um, now Australia's starting to, starting to produce some, some guys from that Australia and Australia even the Mexican league, league a little closer Mexican to home league, which I also coached in um, 2015 or so. Anyway, I was, I coached in Cancun again, like how am I going to say no to going to Cancun and, <laughs> and, uh, and making money. But like you said, they can go over there and make a lot of money, but it's the work that they put in over there and the way that the Koreans go about working kind of like my coaches here. If, uh, until Tom Usborne came here, uh, we did not work the way that we work now. And um, uh, it's the same way with, uh, uh, that it was in, in Korea. You go over there, you're going you're gonna to work, and you're going you're gonna to be able to work at your craft and, and, uh, and make a lot of money. I mean, guys that were done, what kind of, you're saying, what is the profile? If you're thinking that you're finished and you want one more shot, try to, you know, try to sign on over there. Not only will you make a lot of money for your family, uh, but you also uh, uh, will get the necessary means that you need to make it back to the major leagues. That's great advice. I want to get into another opportunity that you're going to have here in the fall. Uh, you were selected to coach in the honorary Negro League game this fall. Can you tell us about what that event is and how you came to be involved in it? Todd Sullivan uh, is uh, a scout. Um, I'm not sure what team he's with, but uh, he came up with this idea a couple of years back. So they've had, they've already had, uh, I want to say uh, maybe last year was the first year, but uh, what he does is they get, he gets prominent families from Sacramento to uh, represent uh, uh both sides, there's two teams, and they, uh, uh, so like last year, it was uh, Greg Vaughn. Uh, Greg Vaughn uh, and his family, which is our family, <laughs> uh, the Vaughn family played against the Jerry Manuel family, which, uh, I mean, uh, two just very big names in Sacramento uh, put together two, two teams, and, uh, and they go at it. The Negro Leagues uh, uh, Museum is is 100% behind this. Um, uh, Todd is the one that, that actually set it up. I was uh, approached by my brother, Danny, um, who was able to attend last year's game with, uh, with Vons against the, uh, uh, the Manuals. And um, uh, they had it at the Rivercat Stadium in Sacramento, which uh, uh, if anyone knows about minor league baseball, they ended up drawing more people than their parent o Oakland A's team did. Uh, and now I think they're the Giants. I think they're associated with the Giants or vice versa. But uh, uh, they ended up, uh, uh, they just draw a tremendous amount of people. Everyone came out. They loved it, the idea. Todd said, I'll do it again. And uh, they asked the, the Roysters to uh, go up against Derek Lee, the, the Lee family, who... Uh, uh, it's very prominent in, in Sacramento also. And uh, it's, an, it's an honor for us, for me and my brothers um, and my nephews and Greg. Um, Greg and I are very close. Um, I like to tell the story that, uh, you know, our family has over 400 home runs. And Greg has 360 of those. And, <laughs> and I have 40. <laughs> but it's uh, this... Uh, 
this event, I'm looking forward to it. Um, now that uh, that our season is over here, I'm going to uh, start spending a bunch of time uh, working on it, just trying to make it uh, as big a, uh, of a deal as, as, as possible. How important is it to you to be a part of preserving the history of the Negro Leagues and share the the legacy of some incredibly talented ball players who never got the chance to play in Major League Baseball. Well, and and that's that's it. I mean, uh, when I go to Sacramento, um, you know, everybody still knows me as Baseball Jerry. You know, Baseball Jerry, uh, uh, the Sacramento athlete. Uh, but we have we have. Let me just say this. At one point in time, Sacramento is so big and so so deep uh, that at one time we had five managers in the major leagues at the same time. There was only, there's only 30 teams, and five of them were from Sacramento. And um, uh, uh, two of them, one of them's Jerry Manu, who I just mentioned, and uh, Dusty Baker uh, is, is another. But, um, I mean, I, I'm embarrassed that I don't do more. That I don't do more than than what I what I've been uh, th- than I have because uh, giving back uh, 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 I do now I'm starting to get get there because I I'm a, I'm doing a lot of programs with Major League Baseball but this one in particular is in Sacramento and I'm able to give back and and uh, and uh, bring some kids out and expose them to uh, 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 to the world basically and. Uh, get them in front of scouts and, 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 and colleges like that. So in talking about this event, we've already touched on uh, several prominent uh, black individuals and families who were very prominent in Major League Baseball. You and your family, the Vaughns, the Lees, the Manuels. I'm going to throw some numbers at you. So of the top 10 leaders uh, in home runs in Major League Baseball history, of the top 10, five of them are black, including the top two, Barry Bonds and Hank Aaron. 10 of the 28 members of the 500 home run club are black players. When you hear those statistics, what's the first thing you think? There could be more. I'm, you know, it, it, obviously I'm, I'm proud of the fact, but there could be more. The, the underserved areas of our country is it's unbelievable. Major League Baseball is starting to do some things. They're starting to come up with some very good programs that that do put these kids in in front of the top coaches and uh, 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 top college coaches and top scouts. Um, it, it's 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 fun for me to watch these kids develop. Watch Cassius Thomas as a freshman, as a freshman, receive the Jackie Robinson Award at Dodger Stadium on opening day. Right. Walk out onto the field and then he comes into our program and, you know, and I want more and more. I want more and more. But, you know, it's it it seems like we're getting less and less at this level. And um, uh, again, like I said, it's starting to change. But uh, I I just wish that I had done more. It's it's. But the fact that I was that I was able to like, though, you talk about the top 10, I've worked with. A lot of those guys, including Hank Aaron, who I was very close with, uh, not as close as Dusty Baker was to him, but uh, Hank, I give him credit for saving my career. I, uh, I, I was, I played in the game when he broke Babe Ruth's record, uh, when he hit his 715th home run. Dusty Baker was on deck. Roland Office, who I mentioned at the top of this show. Uh, ended up replacing him when Hank went out to left field and uh, uh, they called him off and Roland took his place. Uh, um, uh, I was in the other dugout uh, when, when he hit this home run. And, uh, you know, th- these are proud moments for me. These are proud moments for me. But uh, we were also in Atlanta <laughs> and watch, uh, watch Hank Aaron uh, run around the bases as, as a black American uh, in the South, uh, which was mentioned by our broadcaster, Ernie Johnson. Uh, that was, uh, uh, it was a proud moment for me, uh, not only as a black man, but, uh, uh, but as an American. Yeah. I mean, I, I think any baseball fan has seen the replay of, of that clip over and over and over again. I can't, I can't even remotely wrap my head around what it must've been like to 
be present in the dugout or in in the field in that moment. The entire day leading up to that, we were in Cincinnati. The Dodgers, I was playing for the Dodgers, and we were, I'm sorry, they were in Cincinnati, they were in Cincinnati, and we had just come from home. And uh, we arrive in Atlanta, and we're briefed by the FBI because he had gotten so many uh, death threats. Uh, like I said, Dusty was on the other team, and and Dusty uh, uh, was the one that uh, was sheltering um, Hank at this time, you know, uh, along with several other people, uh, Andrew Young and, and several other prominent. What do you mean Americans. sheltering? Just making, you know, that was his safety zone. Uh, Hank was safe around. Uh, uh, at Dusty's house, you know, there's places, I mean, he couldn't just go anywhere. I mean, at the time, he, uh, it, it was really bad leading up to that. And, uh, uh, to get out of town, get to Cincinnati, which wasn't a great place either at the time, but, uh, at least he wasn't, uh, he was able to, to move around a, a little more freely than, uh, he could at, at, even in, in his hometown of Atlanta. Your career also overlapped with that of, uh, Willie Mays at the very, tail end of his career. So we talked about obviously Hank Aaron, the impact that he had in your personal experience uh, with him. What about, uh, what about Willie Mays? Can you speak to which, what do you remember about uh, playing around him in those days? Okay. So I grew up in Sacramento, which is like an hour, 15 minutes from Candlestick Park where Willie Mays played. Uh, We weren't fortunate enough to be able to uh, attend uh, major league baseball games, but my father uh, took me to, um, took me to a game, and I I just remember driving there being being pretty special because uh, it was just him and I. It was just him and I that went to this game, and uh, he knew how much I liked the Dodgers and they were playing the Dodgers. Uh, so in my family, the only ones that liked the Dodgers were me and my mom. <laughs> Everybody else was the San Francisco Giant, 49ers, uh, uh, Oakland Oakland Raiders, uh, 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 Warriors, uh, everything was, was, uh, was Northern California. I liked, I liked the Dodgers because uh, I was a, a huge Maury Wills fan, a huge Maury Wills fan. So uh, my, my dad takes me to a Dodger game, and I remember sitting in the stands uh, watching, watching them play and uh, couldn't wait to see the Dodgers actually right in front of me, right? But there was this Willie Mays guy <laughs> that just stood out and, and uh, was very uh, charismatic. And uh, I liked, I just, I loved the way that he played the game. Um, at the time, I was probably 13 years old, but uh, I ended up going to my first, I ended up going to my first uh, uh, major league game was, was actually uh, one that Willie Mays played in. But also on my first road trip as a Dodger, after I signed and uh, got called up to the major leagues, my first road trip uh, was to New York. And uh, I ended up playing third base. And um, there was a single hit to center field. They hit a single to center field. Willie Mays was on first. Uh, he rounds second and comes in the third base. Uh, I want to say had to be Jimmy Wynn. Um, you know what? It was Von Joshua. Von Joshua ends up throwing the ball to me, and I tagged Willie Mays out. And I remember looking down at him and going, that's Willie Mays. <laughs> and, did, he, uh, did he acknowledge you at all in that moment? Did. And he's filthy, you know, dust flying everywhere. The fields were so bad. And uh, he taps me on my leg and says, nice play. Nice play, kid. And that was my first meeting with him. Since then, you know, I've had several occasions with him, but uh, I remind him of that. And uh, he goes, oh, I did that all the time. I, I did that to anybody that, that got me out. He goes, he goes, because I wasn't out very often. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Willie Mays was uh, uh, my experience. That experience, that one experience is, again, I remember that like I remember Hank Aaron hit breaking Babe Ruth's record. What a memory. Yeah. That's an incredible memory. Um, you are correct when you say that the percentage of black players in Major League Baseball has declined. It was around 20% in the 1970s, and now we're down to 8%. Um, first of all, what do you attribute that drop-off to? 
you know what? If I had the answer, and I and we talk about it a lot, uh, the Players Alliance. Uh, I'm I'm doing this stuff with the Breakthrough Series. Uh, uh, Tony Regans, who uh, uh, who's just doing big stuff with uh, uh, with Major League Baseball to bring just to bring attention to these all these facts. But um, I struggle with the fact that. They want to say, oh, well, they're playing other sports. It's hard to play baseball, and it is. It's very difficult. I, I saw the other day where, anyway, I don't even want to get into <laughs> some of the stuff that's happening with uh, our travel baseball or, and some of the stuff that, that's going on. But it's, I just want the underserved areas to have the same opportunity as everyone else. They, they, won't, all, they won't go play basketball. They won't go play um, uh, uh, football, you know, I don't see why it's easier for them to do that than it is for baseball. I mean, that baseball for me, I remember climbing over our school fence with three or four of our guys and going out and play, playing baseball. And I know people are going to say, Oh yeah, oh, this is the olden days. It's, it's, it's all different now. It is all different, but the opportunities are less. I don't think that they have the same opportunity as I had. And, uh, and that, uh, my father made for me, but, uh, I just wish I, I, I watch things happening that are getting better. Um, I watch this breakthrough series that Major League Baseball is coming up with, the RBI, some of the things that are, that are starting to work. This player alliance will not quit until uh, things are better. Uh, and the work that they're doing, Jeffrey Hammonds and his whole group, um, the stuff that they're doing is uh, uh, bringing the attention that is needed. And, uh, and I think that, that, that things are going to get better. I'm optimistic that they will get better. Yeah, like you said, Major League Baseball is making significant strides in trying to bring that percentage up through programs like RBI. They've helped provide scholarships for athletes to attend, HBCUs, and also you know other elite baseball programs, UCLA, Florida. Hank Aaron Invitational, yep. which I have been part of for the last three years, and um, who Hank Aaron actually attended the last year that he was with us alive with this, the players, 144 players show up at Dodger Town, which is now called Jackie Robinson Sports Complex. Uh, 144 underserved kids, um, and 44 of them are picked to go and get on a plane and fly to Atlanta, just like Major League Baseball players do. They're coached by Andre Dawson. They're coached by Mike Sosha. They're coached by Eric Davis. They're coached... Uh, uh, Ken Griffey Jr., Ken Griffey Sr., just goes on and on. Some of the best pitching coaches ever, you know, Marvin Freeman, some of the guys that we work with, uh, uh, just to name a few. I'm leaving out names that I shouldn't, but uh, uh, these kids are getting coached for one week for seven days. And then the top 44, because that was Hank's number, are picked, uh, 22 on each side, and they go, they fly. They fly into, they fly to a, uh, to Atlanta, put up at a, at the same major league hotel as the visiting teams, and go to the ballpark and do everything, batting practice and the whole works. Get dressed in the locker rooms, and uh, and get to meet Hank Aaron and other prominent uh, uh, Atlantans. Uh, it's it's for me that's the best program and and I will continue to do that even after I'm done with my high school stuff. And so between all of those programs, RBI, the Hank Aaron Classic, the Players mm -hmm. Alliance, like you mentioned, which is a more social justice oriented program, what has been the result, both in terms of uh, increasing interest and participation, and then just the general. Uh, conditions for for black players. Oh, it's been great. I mean, uh, Tim Corbin uh, from Vanderbilt. I mean, Michigan. I mean, a lot of major uh, a lot of major colleges show up for this. I remember after Michigan played Vanderbilt a few years back uh, for the national championship. Two days later, both coaches were sitting in the stands at this uh, breakthrough series and and the Hank Aaron Invitational. You know, just exposed. So. Um, uh, I went back last year to um, uh, to the event was it last year, maybe the year before, uh, and sitting in the stands with all the scouts was Tim Corbin. And he says, hey, Jerry, he goes, uh, uh, 
you know, how's, how's such and such doing? How's this guy doing? And he's there to see these kids. It's, it's 44 underserved kids. And now those kids are going to be at the top of these draft. This upcoming draft, they will definitely be at the top of it. Top 10, you'll see Jade Newt and Cassius are both part of the program. And they, they will be in this, you know, let's just say top 60, top 100 players picked in the, in the country. But I'm going to say they're gonna, one of them will be not these two guys, but there will be a player from there that's picked first or second in, in this year's draft. So just, things are getting better. So you ask how they're doing. They're, they're doing their things. Things are moving this way. A little bit too slow. <laughs> a little bit too slow. But uh, uh, but to have players at the top of the draft are getting consistently getting drafted and getting looks. Uh, that that's the goal of these programs, and uh, uh, it's starting to happen. You acknowledge obviously progress is being made, albeit maybe a little bit slower than than you would like. Uh, you even expressed just a little bit earlier that you were, you said, embarrassed even that that you personally weren't doing more. So in your opinion, what does more look like, both in terms of what you want your personal involvement to be and also what Major League Baseball needs to do going forward? Well, we're here at Sierra Canyon, and, and I'd love to see this program get better. Uh, we just had a Jackie Robinson day. Let me go back, and I want to get back to that, but let, let me go back. I went to Jackie Robinson Day three years ago, and uh, they had a bunch of uh, ex-Dodgers there, and um, it, including Sandy Koufax. It was um, uh, uh, Tommy Lasorda. Just everybody's there, and so was Rachel Robinson. And... Uh, 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 and, and other members of the family. So... The game starts, well, before the game starts, we're up in a booth and they're acknowledging some of the black players on the field, but they were all on the other team. The Dodgers had no black players on their team. That's right. That was before Mookie Betts came in. It was before Mookie Betts and right after Yasiel, I believe. I can't remember. But anyway, uh, we're standing up top and Sandy Koufax comes to me. He says, Jerry, he goes, isn't this sad that we actually have to go and and, well, Matt Kemp was, I guess, on the Reds at the time, and uh, uh, there was a couple of Reds players that used to be Dodgers, and they were recognizing these guys, and they're tipping their hat. And and Sandy comes over to me, he says, it, it, he goes, it's just sad that that is to this point. Dave Roberts uh, was the only uh, was the only uh, black person uh, on the field at the time, and it was, uh, you know, things like that. Though those are embarrassing times, and uh, it was. You know, we honored we honored Rachel and we honored Jackie every year. We did the same thing this year at Sierra Canyon. Had a huge Jackie Robinson high school thing, and the, our opponents at the time, I believe, it was Campbell Hall. And um, uh, I told the coach that we were going to do it, and um, he goes, uh, "I think it was Campbell Hall. Mm, I got might have the wrong team, but anyway." So we have the Jackie Robinson Day and. Both teams line up, uh, not on the foul lines, but facing the audience. And um, we brought in Lee Lacey, uh, who is a prominent black player with the Dodgers back in the, back in the 70s. Uh, James Loney, who played for me in AAA, and I was able to send to the major leagues and had a great career with the Dodgers. Uh, Roland Office also came in for that. He came in just for that. And the, our head of school... Uh, uh, just uh, had this great gave this great speech about Jackie Robinson and what it what it means and uh, uh, how uh, it tied in with me and the other three guys. Uh, they are all in their Jackie Robinson uniforms. I had all, Jackie Robinson uniforms for all of our players. Just so doing stuff like that, uh, you know, it, I might have felt a different pride than some of the other players or some of the other coaches, but. Uh, uh, we had we have three kids in our entire program, three black kids in our entire program, uh, and that's not good. What can we do? We could do a lot better than that here at Sierra Canyon. Our, it's, it's not like Sierra Canyon doesn't do that as a whole, but in our in my program, um, you know, I think that uh, we can do a, a, a lot better job at bringing in uh, uh, minorities and underserved kids, and uh, 
making that Jackie Robinson day a special, it was a very special day. Might've been the most special day for me since I've been at Sierra Canyon. And uh, it represented a, it represented a lot of that stuff, a lot of the uh, going back to my childhood and, and everything else. And uh, Dusty Baker heard about it and, um, you know, gave me a little, gave me some props on it. So it was pretty cool to, uh, to see that they were doing that at this level, honoring Jackie Robinson at the high school level. I hope that's I hope more teams. To do. I hope more teams uh, take up your lead and, and follow suit with that. Yes. The last thing that I want to ask before we wrap up for today, um, you played in more than 600 games in minor league baseball. We obviously talked mm-hmm. about your coaching experience, but you had a pretty uh, expansive playing career in the minor leagues as well. Now, whether it's your players who are about to hear their names called in the draft or players from other programs who are, you know, maybe watching this show, uh, describe the grind, the lifestyle of minor league baseball and the advice that you have for the players that are about to experience that for the very first time. Again, I played in the minor leagues in the seventies. Uh, I was fortunate enough after two and a half years in the minor leagues, I got called up for the first time. I did go back down, but, uh, but I went back down and I ended up winning a batting title. And, uh, and that was the difference. That was the last time I played in the minor leagues. But um, nowadays, I, I think it's extremely difficult. I don't, I don't see how the kids are able to do it nowadays. Back when I did it, we pulled together. I, my roommate was Rick Roden was one of my first roommates, was also a Dodger uh, pitcher, an all-star pitcher with the Dodgers and, and the Pirates. And um, uh, we would pull our money together or we'd get our checks and we'd go to the local, the, one of the local stores, uh, grocery stores was called Publix in, in Florida. And, uh, <laughs> and we'd cash our checks. Mine was $199 uh, for the two weeks. And, you know, so, uh, and so we had to pull our money together. So we had four kids living in it, living in a two bedroom, uh, two kids in each room. And um, uh, uh, we would uh, we'd win prizes. So if we if we got an RBI, it was like uh, let's see, the name of the company was Arby's, Arby's, Arby's uh, roast beef sandwiches. And uh, if you knocked in a run, you get an RB, RBI, which means that you get a, a free sandwich from Arby's, right? So, and if you hit a home run, you got breakfast for two at Sambo's which was a, a derogatory name for, for a restaurant, but uh, it was uh, 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 but it, at, at Sambo's. So it was great breakfast. It was at the, you know, that's what it was at the time. So we would, you know, if I hit a home run and, a, and knocked in two runs, man, we can all eat. We, you know, we could eat breakfast and we could eat dinner <laughs> at the same time. That's how it was. Nowadays, they get not much more than we got. I mean, I'm going to say they get a thousand dollars you know some some of the kids two thousand dollars a month which you can't do very much with anymore uh when i say that two thousand dollars a month uh there's kids making ten thousand dollars for the year and those months are only for the months that you play and uh so trying to get housing and they don't you know they have social media now but uh now with the nil coming up the things might might be a little bit better but uh uh kids coming out of high school are going to have a little bit more money and be able to uh, support themselves. But uh, we had to pull together for, to eat. We had to pull together to get to and from the ballpark. Um, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches were the norms before games. Uh, <laughs> a lot of Ritz crackers <laughs> that I can remember. And uh, the food's a little bit better, but uh, the situations aren't. It's still 13 hours of travel and and uh, things like that uh, that uh, that never show up. They have a better they have better playing facilities now, but uh, it's just really hard on on minor league baseball right now. But they're working on that too. They're working on that in in the in the negotiations and the uh, uh, hopefully they'll rectify that situation. And your advice to the players who are about to find themselves uh, in that grind and in the professional baseball ranks? Jump jump in it. Go after it. See how quickly you can get out of there. Uh, they, all these, all my kids, the kids here that, that are draft possibilities, including Max Martin and, and, uh, Jaden and Cassius, 
uh, those guys uh, that 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 might go in the draft or might become professionals this year. I mean, you, your goal is to try to get out of there, learn as much as you can, and get out of there as quickly as you can, and get on television and and uh, and uh, start hitting bombs for <laughs> in Major League Baseball, making a lot of money and paying back your parents for giving you hundred dollar hitting lessons and things like that. <laughs> well. This has definitely been one of my favorite conversations we've had on the program. I hope you enjoyed it as well. It's been great, Phil. It's 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 nice. I don't i I wish I was able to to talk more about it, but uh, it's it's it, this has been great. I'm glad that we were able to uh, get it out on your platform. Well, you're welcome back anytime, Head Coach Jerry Royster. Thank you so much for joining us on the Cannon Sports Podcast, and we will see you next time. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe and follow on Instagram at Canon Sports, TikTok at Canon Sports Official, and of course, canonsports.com for all your sporting goods needs.